All right, we are live for the June Cocktails and Fishtails here in year 2021. We've made it halfway through <laughs> and delighted to be here with you all. So uh, my name, of course, is Stina Troyer. I'm your science specialist and host of this lovely science social. And we're so excited to have Dr. David Trimbach here to help us explore um, our sense of Puget Sound here. And so before we get into that, I kind of just want to go over a little bit of how this format works. We're, of course, going live on Facebook. So your interaction through comments and questions is greatly appreciated. And we're even going to tease you in with a couple um, interactive pieces. So uh, please, you know, be quick with those keys. Let us know what your answers are to some of the questions we have for you so we can moderate, moderate those David's way tonight. Um, and uh, while you while you get settled in wherever you're tuning in from, um, <laughs> hopefully you're excited to have a cocktail and a fish tail or whatever beverage of choice you might be imbibing on this evening. Um, we always like to kick off kick it off uh, by asking our presenters what their favorite cocktail is and if they would be willing to share a, a delightful fish tail. So David, can you? Uh, take it away with with those two questions. <laughs> sure, thank you. And thanks everybody for being here um, and tuning in. Uh, I, for me, my favorite cocktail, it's fairly easy. Uh, I like anything frozen. <laughs> it does not matter what it is. Um, I'm there for it. Um, and a fishtail for me, I was, I was trying to think about that. Um, so the first time I ever went fishing like in marine waters. I was a child. I was on a boat. I'm from, originally from Ohio. Um, I'm not used to a lot of those things and I got not only very sick, <laughs> um, but I also when I was when I was about to catch what I thought was my first like fish, um, it was I was pulling and I was struggling and it ended up uh, what I ended up pulling out was a fish head because a barracuda had actually eaten my fish while it was on uh, my hook. So oh I caught a fish head. Yeah. That is not <laughs> pretty... the most tasty part. I guess it's <laughs> no. like fish cheeks, like <laughs> I guess are a big deal, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a bummer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I definitely, I think, was excited at that time because that meant I could just go back and lay down, fall asleep on the boat, but... <laughs> <laughs> but it was definitely memorable. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing. Stephen. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, uh, and so it looks like we have some lovely folks tuning in. I'm just going to get uh, myself squared away so I make sure that I can see the questions and comments as they're, as they're coming our way. Uh, so let me just get that set up. And click all the right buttons, hopefully. <laughs> See us here. Excellent. Okay, so, um, whoops, whoops, whoops. I don't actually want that on this computer. Let me do that on the other computer, because otherwise it's going to talk to me through this one, and then you're going to hear the presentation twice, and that's just, uh, sounds disastrous. So, we'll avoid disaster when we look over here. <laughs> okay, I see, I see these people tuning in. We're, we're good. Um, and we're muted, which is, I think, the most important part in this exciting technological endeavors here. Um, so yeah, with that, um, I'm excited to have David back um, here. I got to see a presentation for the South Sound Surfrider Group, which gave me the, the, the bright idea to say, hey, would you be willing to do a Cocktails and Fishtails presentation with us? And um, well, uh, definitely excited to see how the virtual format works here. So um, for all of you tuning in again, get ready for the questions we're going to throw your way. And uh, with that, I'm going to just go ahead and turn it right over to you uh, to explore our sense of place in Puget Sound. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I imagine you can see my screen. Yes. Okay, cool. Just making sure you never know. Um, so thank you so much, Stina. Uh, and thanks everyone who is tuning in today. 
Um, just a little bit about myself. So my name is David Trimbach and I'm a research associate in the Department of Fisheries, Wildlife and Conservation Sciences at Oregon State University. I'm also part of the Human Dimensions Lab, uh, which is a, a lab that basically focuses on the human dimensions of fisheries, wildlife and conservation sciences. So we're social scientists who do environmental work. Um, we do exist and we do very interesting and cool work. Um, and you might be wondering why OSU and Puget Sound? Well, while I work for Oregon State University, I'm actually housed at and I work in very close collaboration with the Puget Sound Partnership, which is a Washington State agency that is based in Tacoma, Washington. So much of my work, if not the majority of my work, relates to Puget Sound and the greater uh, Salish Sea region. Um, I'm a geographer by training, uh, and so place issues of uh, anything related to place, I, I'm very interested in. Um, I find it fascinating, particularly people, place, relationships, and interactions. Um, and today's presentation focuses on exploring sense of place in Puget Sound. Um, this actually weaves together three relatively recent research projects all related to this idea of sense of place. Um, and before jumping into what that is and or isn't, I thought I would start uh, with a interactive activity, which Stina is helping me with through her multiple screens. Um, and so I have three interwoven questions for the audience, uh, for you, all of, all of you out there who I do not necessarily see. <laughs> um, so I, I, I'm posing these questions to, to you. So number one, do I identify with Puget Sound? The simple yes or no. Uh, are you attached to Puget Sound? Also, yes or no. And in one word, that could be a noun, adjective, uh, other word, verb, <laughs> what does Puget Sound mean to you? So we're thinking about issues of identity, attachment, and meaning as they relate to Puget Sound. So take some time, respond. Um, and if, and Stina, if you could maybe read some responses off, if, if they come in, that would be awesome. Uh. I, I went ahead and gave a, you know, as the as the hostess, you like to demonstrate, right? So I answered yes, yes, and included the word wonder. And also a lovely uh, reminder for a land acknowledgement um, from another comment that we are on the land of the Puyallup people, at least that's where I'm tuning in from today. So fun to know. We want to make a land acknowledgement in our in our stream. That seems like a fitting thing to do a, for a sense of place presentation. Totally. Ooh, we have a word treasure. Da -na -na. Peaceful is another word. People are people are like in the uh, in one word. What does the Puget Sound mean to you? Uh, we have got Kim tuning in with a yes, yes, bountiful. Uh, April has yes, yes, ecosystem. Is it is it cheating if we ask you is, in in doing presentations like this? Uh, have you gotten some interesting responses? Uh, Eileen says no. Yes, explore. And we have a yes, more and more every day. Yes, attached, especially through swimming and the word life. These are all awesome responses. Um, I think for me. Um, Yes, yes, and I think um, therapy. Ooh, I love that. <laughs> you have another one that says, yes, yes, home. Oh, sense of place. <laughs> oh, good, good one. Um, and so 
When it comes to these issues of identity, attachment, and meaning, um, what we're actually trying to get at is this notion of sense of place. Um, and so, let's see. And so I'm actually gonna be talking about sense of place within the context of three specific projects that I've been working on. Um, these are complete um, and sense of place is one of those topics that I really enjoy studying, especially in this region. Um, and this is just a list of some of those projects. So the ones in black um, are those that I'm actually gonna be presenting on. And all of these are accessible. And I, I think I've shared them with Stina. So if you do have an interest in any of these topics, um, especially if you're interested in like ecosystem recovery or environmental management issues, feel free to contact me. Um, and then I do have a, a, another paper that just came out on sense of place in this greater Salish Sea region. And I have a, a, another paper coming out um, any day now um, focused on the relationship between geographic literacy and sense of place uh, in the Salish Sea region. So sense of place, what is it? Uh, well, first, it's, it's interdisciplinary, it's multidimensional, meaning that many different social science disciplines study it, and oftentimes they study it differently. Um, so, for example, geography, which is where I come from, and environmental psychology, um, which is where many of my colleagues come from. Uh, we often talk about sense of place together, but we oftentimes think of it slightly differently. And I think it's important to recognize that there are a lot of different approaches and understandings of it. And for me, I'm, I'm taking a really Really specific approach, and I have a very specific definition which I'll share. Um, it's also multidimensional, meaning it's not just one thing. It's often approached as many different things that are kind of messy and uh, seen as being uh, mutually constitutive, meaning they, they constitute one another as an idea. Um, it is foundational to geography, um, and I think it's always important to remember that. Uh, and the, the, the person who is credited with bringing this to um, contemporary social science is Yifu Tuan, who is pictured here. Um, and he was really interested from more of like a philosophical perspective uh, about like those emotional bonds or even fears that human beings have with different places. Uh, because we do, we, we may not be cognizant of of those appreciations or love or fear all the time, but they do exist and they are something that I think is shared among all human beings. Um, in geography, we, we consider a sense of place as being a, an integral aspect of place itself. Um, and so we can't, it's not just like the land under our feet. It's something more powerful and meaningful that we often don't necessarily talk about, um, but it is something um, that exists. These are two kind of very broad, vague definitions of sense of place um, from two actually intro to geography textbooks. Um, so one sees sense of place as a set of meanings attached to an area. Um, another sees it as emotional attachments or, or providing a feeling of belonging or a collective identity. Um, but I think it's a lot more than that. It's a little more complicated. Um, and so there are some agreed upon dimensions. Um, and this is, uh, these are kind of reflected in this image here, which is a conceptual model from a 2020 paper. Um, and so uh, I feel like many contemporary social scientists see sense of place of being divided up into place identity. So those various identities that we attribute to place are, are associated with place. And these could be things like, you have an identity that's attached to maybe your neighborhood, uh, maybe your hometown or the state where you grew up, um, maybe the country where your ancestors come from, you might have an identity as associated with that. There are many different types of place-based identities. Um, there's also attachment, which are those attachments or bonds or connections that people have with place. Um, regardless of what that place is, you might be really attached to maybe a specific room in your house um, or a specific part of, Seattle that you really enjoy, um, those all reflect different types of attachments. Um, and then there's also meaning, which is which are those variety of meanings which could be descriptive or symbolic. There are a lot of different types of meanings that we ascribe to place. Um, and then there's also uh, place uh, dependence, which are those uh, dependencies or reliances on place um, that human beings have to meet specific goals or needs. Um, and those really range. And all of these are connected. So place attachment and place meaning um, impact one another. Um, and these are also connected to our experiences, emotions, engagement, and embodiment of place. And embodiment, embodiment, I think, is often something that we don't necessarily think about. But if you... <clears throat> 
come from a specific location in the United States that has a specific dialect or accent, um, or even specific slang or specific terms that you use that might be dis distinct from people elsewhere in the United States, you are literally embodying that place. You are, that place has imprinted itself on you as a person and it's reflected in how you speak or what you say. Um, and that's something that we don't necessarily think about unless we're kind of out of town, we're somewhere else. And we realize that we're slightly different or we speak sli slightly differently than other people. Um, and this also, I think, which is one of the reasons why sense of place is becoming more common in environmental management and environmental research is that sense of place is seen as something that directly informs our understandings of place, but also our behaviors, um, including our responses to place change. So as this model suggests, sense of place informs in, uh, place-based behaviors like pro-environmental stewardship behaviors. So people who tend to have strong, or higher senses of place are more likely, as the theory suggests, um, they're more likely to engage in pro-environmental behaviors like stewardship or not littering, for example. Um, and it's important to always recognize that sense of place is not always positive. Like there is such a thing as negative sense of place and we have negative senses of place all the time. Maybe there are parts of town that you don't like to visit, or maybe there are parts of the country that you just don't want to go to, um, that might be associated with a negative sense of place of that particular location. Um, sense of place is something that is growing in environmental management. Um, and that's not just because we use it to understand um, behavior or responses to place change, but because it's also uh, considered an aspect of human well being and health. So for individuals who have a certain level of well-being and health, it's understood that they likely have a strong or high sense of place, among many other factors that go into well-being and health. Um, it's also understood as illustrating or informing conflict. Oftentimes, environmental restoration conflicts are partly derived from conflicting or divergent senses of place. If you think about a, a restoration area, there might be individuals that don't want restoration to happen, maybe for a lot of different kinds of reasons. Um, but then you also have restoration practitioners who are trying to modify that location um, for specific purposes. And because these two groups have very different understandings of what that place could be or should be, you see conflict emerge. And so there are a lot of scholars that look at sense of place as an element of conflict. Um, uh, other individuals who look at environmental management and restoration use sense of place as, as something that could influence success, efficiency, and participation in recovery projects. If you have a project that is well-designed that purposefully integrates or a uh, sense of place, um, maybe you know, uh, you, you gauge your community's connections to place and you integrate those elements into your project with the purpose of trying to foster a stronger connection um, among your stakeholders or partners that you're, that you're engaged with. Um, and, and sense of place does vary, uh, but it is often pattern which allows for empirical study. Um, so sense of place, like even though it originated more within humanism and philosophy, it actually is an, a construct that we can empirically study and measure. Um, and that is partly why it, ha it does inform environmental management policy and planning, um, including the human well-being vital signs, uh, which are the Puget Sound partnerships, um, social and ecological measures of recovery and ecosystem health. And so sense of place is studied in our region. And I think it's important to recognize other studies that have looked at it. Um, Melissa Poe is a social scientist from Washington Sea Grant uh, who conducted a sense of place study um, quite a few years ago. Um, and it focused on shellfish harvesting uh, among tribal and non-tribal members in Puget Sound. And actually she, what the study found was that the actual practice and engagement in shellfish harvesting fostered and created a greater sense of place among those individuals who participated in those practices. Um, Kelly Biedenweg, who I work with at OSU, um, she actually led the process to identify uh, those human well-being vital signs, which are those green and orange uh, components here on the wheel, they range from things like local foods, outdoor activity, stewardship, good governance, cultural well-being, and sense of place. Um, so uh, Kelly actually led this multi-year process to figure out, you know, 
what are those elements that Puget Sound residents think about or identify or prioritize as contributing to their well being as it relates to the natural environment? Um, and in this um, image with the circles here, you see kind of in the middle what those specific elements are, um, and those include sense of place. So uh, sense of place is something that we use in our region um, to understand ecosystem health. And I think that that's really interesting and really cool that everyone does that. Um, and I think it's something that illustrates that um, communities recognize that place matters to them for a lot of different reasons. Um, and so an element of the vital signs is the human well-being vital signs survey. Um, and this is something that my lab actually at OSU um, helps conduct every two years. Um, we actually send out 9,000 surveys to residents in the 12 counties of Puget Sound um, through a really specific social science method, which is focused on like large scale male surveys. Someone in this watching this may have received one. I do not know. It's very random, um, but people do respond. So in 2018, we received over 2000 responses through the mail, um, which I think is pretty wild. Uh, and then in 2020, we received uh, 1800 responses, um, both over 20, 25 and up per, uh, respond, uh, response rates, which is really good um, for a contemporary survey. Um, and with that data, we actually do a lot of statistical analyses, um, including frequencies, and then we even run regressions to illustrate like what factors like influence people's well-being. Um, and we actually have a PhD student, uh, Whitney Fleming, who is the person who had uh, the lead on this particular project. So just to give you a sense of like, we actually look at sense of place in, in general for public agencies. Um, and all of this data, all of this information is public. So if you're interested in this information, please seek it out, it does exist. Um, so uh, looking at these two surveys, so in 2018, uh, hopefully you can see this here, we found out or, or through our results, uh, we realized that Puget Sound residents do have a higher strong sense of place um, in relation to Puget Sound's natural environment, um, particularly attachment, identity, and a sense of pride, which is another uh, measure that we use um, to understand sense of place. Are you proud um, to be a resident or live in this region? And we conducted the survey again in 2020, which was a very different kind of year to conduct any type of research. Um, just because of obviously for co because of COVID, um, and, but people did respond, and it, we actually just completed a report for the Peach Sound Partnership. So this information is really new. Um, so you're one of the first groups of people to see it, pu pu public wise. Um, so again, we found overall that Puget Sound residents do have a high or strong sense of place in relation to Puget Sound's natural environment. Um, and I think they, compared to similar studies that have been co conducted elsewhere and nationally, uh, I believe we found that Puget Sound residents actually have a slightly higher sense of place or connection um, to the natural environment compelled, compared to residents elsewhere in the United States. Um, and although the results of 2020 were slightly lower from the 2018 results, it is still higher strong. Um, particularly when it comes to uh, attachment, being proud, and uh, even having a sense of responsibility to the natural environment. Um, so this, using this data that we collected through this survey, um, we started to think of all other kinds of questions, other kinds of projects um, that we could explore. Um, and something that I had been wanting to study was the relationship between place attachment, length of residency and stewardship, because we are constantly hearing about or constantly talking about how much population change we're experiencing in Puget Sound. Um, we are considered, Seattle's considered a transplant city. I imagine Tacoma might be too now. Um, the state of Washington is consistently ranked one of the fastest growing states in the country. Seattle as well, fastest growing city. And so for me, I really wanted to know um, how do these newer residents compare to residents who have been here a long time? What are their connections to Puget Sound? Are they similar or are they different? Um, and so we conducted a statistical analysis using all of that survey data from the 2018 survey to explore those questions. Um, so uh, this is just a little bit of background just so we, we are all on the same page. We all probably know that Puget Sound is growing. Um, 
so, but this is just a little bit of information. So uh, for example, King, Pierce, Snohomish, and Kitsap counties have all gained over 500,000 new residents since 2010. Every, according to the state of Washington, every single county in Puget Sound has experienced change over the population growth over the past 10 years, uh, which is pretty incredible. Much of this relates to non-native born residents coming to Washington. Um, and this is also being experienced in Oregon. This isn't a unique, necessarily unique thing uh, here. This is also being experienced in Texas and other areas that are seeing huge influxes of new residents. Um, I, I think something that's really unique and interesting within the case of Washington is that non-native born residents are, are actually uh, the majority in the state now. Um, compared to native born Washingtonians. And a lot of this actually has sparked conflict, uh, as you can see from these headlines from different um, newspapers uh, or this image from a news, uh, news story. Um, a lot of, there's a lot of scapegoating and a lot of um, uh, biases against new residents. And I think that plays out oftentimes in the media, um, but I think it also trickles into conversations as it relates to the environment and, and also just planning and policy in general. We oftentimes maybe think or hear of people kind of blaming new residents um, and not to say that there are no consequences to growth and change, because there are. Um, but I was really curious about like, um, what is the background of this? What's the history of this? And it turns out there's a very long, over a hundred years long history, um, particularly like in the early 20th century and then later in the 1980s and 90s um, of people being scared um, or having conflict with new residents. So this isn't new. This is like a new manifestation of an ongoing process. Um, much of the current growth is directly related to tech industries that are located here. And that's also something that we're probably very much so aware of. Um, so we took this data from the survey and, and decided to look at the relationships among sense of place stewardship and like the residents. Um, and as we say in our paper, um, like are the region's newcomers wholly detached, blase and uninterested in the region's place-based concerns? Does the region's growing non-native population care about the region's natural environment or do they engage in pro-environmental behaviors? And that's something that we really wanted to know. And so uh, we conducted some statistical analyses. All of this is not obviously easily digestible. Um, but what we found out is that individuals, like I stated before, do have a relatively strong uh, or high uh, sense of place, or in this case, place attachment, which is a, a component of sense of place. Um, we also found out that individuals occasionally engage in stewardship behaviors. Um, so overall, the mean was 3.5 um, on a um, let me see, this was like a 1.5 frequency scale. So five meaning you engage in stewardship every day. Maybe Stina does. She would probably be the one person I know that does that. Um, oh, shucks. <laughs> um, but I don't think most people do. Most people say that they at least engage in stewardship once a month, um, which is good, right? People should be engaging in some stewardship. We should be taking care of where we live. Um, and then we conducted some more sophisticated st statistics. Uh, we conducted some regression analyses to see um, what predicts stewardship behaviors in Puget Sound. Um, and we actually found that uh, place attachment specifically, the, that idea of being attached to a place was significantly associated uh, at predicting stewardship behavior. So people who have a strong place attachment are more likely to engage in stewardship in Puget Sound region. Um, and I think most interestingly, we found that years lived in Puget Sound was not significant at all. Um, so actually individuals who engage in stewardship uh, it's about the same amount of time for new and old residents. So it doesn't matter how long you've been here, new or old, you're engaging in the same amount of stewardship activities, which kind of runs counter to what we kind of think or hear about. So some, some general conclusions is that length of residency does not meaningfully correlate to place attachment. So people are attached regardless of how long they've lived here. Um, and that's actually supported by some other work. Um, place attachment, uh, to the region's natural environment was high among all residents in Puget Sound. And length of residence, again, these are not linked or predictive of stewardship behaviors. And so in my mind, this illustrates that we really need to change the newcomer narrative or story. We often think that, we often think that new people are just going to change and maybe make where we live um, worse off than it is already. Um, but I do think that residents do care. 
Um, and I think we need to do a better job of telling that story and better having, having better conversations with new people here um, in order to better harness this strong connection and potential for stewardship that people have in the region. Um, so even though we are a transplant city, if not transplant state, um, people are connected to where they live um, and do engage in pro-environmental behaviors. So in building upon this project, I really wanted to better understand what about different aspects of the environment um, and in its relationship to sense of place? Because the first study looked at kind of Puget Sound as a whole, as this kind of like broad, vague uh, environment. Um, and so I was really curious about what's the relationship between sense of place and specific landscapes, specific places that people go to. And for me, shorelines is a place that I go to, um, but it's also something that I think is important for us to study. Um, and so I, I, I conducted a survey on sense of place of shorelines. Um, so in, in Puget Sound partnership world, I was looking at like, what is the relationship perhaps between shoreline armoring or those like infrastructures that we put along the shore um, and people, how they feel about place. Uh, I was really curious to see if there was a connection. So uh, shoreline armoring, just so you don't have to know all of this, but it's ubiquitous. We know what shoreline armoring looks like. It's like seawalls. If you ever go to Owen Beach, you're likely walking on a seawall for most part of the time, most of the time, if, especially if it's a high tide. Um, there are a lot of different types of shoreline armoring. Uh, approximately 30% of Puget Sound's shorelines are armor, hard armored. So there is some sort of artificial, um, usually concrete structure or riprap structure along the shore. Um, so it does vary in the region. More than 50% of King County shoreline is armored versus 6.3% in San Juan County. Most armor that you see today is associated with uh, single family residences. Um, and even though it is common, it does negatively impact the nor near shore environment. We know this, there's local research that supports that. Um, this disrupts habitat for forage fish, salmon, vegetation, um, which ripples through the marine food web to even us. So, and additionally, why shorelines beyond this ecological site? Well, there's a growing social science and, human and humanities research on shorelines and coasts. Um, specifically this idea that shorelines are distinct or unique places that human beings go to and interact with. Um, and this relates to this idea of a liminal landscape, which is something that I've been really interested in. Um, liminal landscapes are specific distinct landscapes that are those at the fringes, limits, or entail a sense of in-betweenness, which shorelines um, do if you think about shorelines and tides, right? They, they, you could go to the same beach every day and it's different. And that's because it is this kind of liminal space. Um, and uh, liminal landscapes are also associated with this sense of escape, freedom, transformation, um, also the sense of exploration, um, which I think someone had mentioned earlier, but also like issues of creativity. People tend to think of these kind of places as sparking creativity. Um, and so uh, in addition to that, there's also a lot of research on place change, particularly infrastructure and its influences on people, which we often don't necessarily think about. So I conducted a 12 county survey um, in, in our region uh, and the, I ended up having 413 respondents. Um, my, my sample was highly representative of the region. It was purposefully done um, that way. So it was uh, represented by age, sex, and by county of residence. And while San Juan doesn't, nothing shows up here, there were people that did participate from San Juan, but they are a very small um, uh, percentage of the respondents. And what I found was that um, particularly when it comes to place attachment and issues of belonging, people do actually have a place attachment and sense of belonging to the shoreline, to near shore areas. Um, that was something that I was really actually like excited to see. I wasn't sure, like, yeah, Puget Sound, we get a sense as to what that is and isn't. But when it comes to really specific landscape types, I wasn't necessarily sure if people would have similar attachments or connections. And people do, over 50% of respondents um, say that they completely agree or agree um, that shorelines are um, places of belonging or attachment for them. Um, I also asked an open-ended question similar to what I, we did today. Um, so I asked, what does Puget Sound 
shoreline mean to you? Um, and I got a lot of different responses and I used kind of like a pre-created framework to analyze them qualitatively. Um, so uh, I, I created these categories based on what have been, has been previously done. And then I looked at the frequency of use and then I have some examples. So the most commonly uh, used place meanings are feelings. So feelings, emotions, sentiments that people derive from a particular place. like. Um, like calm or peaceful or peace were, are real, were actually really common responses. Um, another was inherent meaning. So these are those tangible intrinsic or innate aspects of a place. Um, so if you think of nature being one, um, and what was another, water, these are different types of tangible meanings that people think of when they think about a shoreline. Um, another one is connection, which directly relates to the other aspects of sense of place. So this idea of like attachment, senses of belonging, um, or even a sense of home, which I think someone also mentioned in their response earlier. Um, and while not well, that with a low frequency, people actually do kind of get a sense of um, the liminality of shorelines. People sense that shorelines are distinct or unique places. Uh, that are maybe different from elsewhere. Other places that they could go in nature, shorelines are slightly different. And so an example of that was someone said that shorelines gave them an overall sense of freedom, um, which I, I think also uh, someone had mentioned exploration, which I think also kind of fits into that idea of liminality. Um, so I also conducted some statistical analyses um, and I did find that length of residence was associated with sense of place. Shoreline property ownership was also strongly associated with sense of place. Um, and that place of residence was associated with seeing the shoreline. So I also asked questions of, if you can go back, if I go back. So seeing and interacting with the shoreline and whether or not um, they were important to people. So in certain parts of Puget Sound, it does play a role. Um, so some key takeaways, people do have a sense of place of the shoreline. Um, length of re residence does play a role, which actually kind of challenges the previous study um, in which it didn't. Um, and I, in my mind, especially someone who really like digs into the literature, um, I think it has to do with the specificity of the shoreline versus the vagueness or broadness of Puget Sound. Uh, I think that in general, people move to Puget Sound from afar, partly because of the natural environment. And there are studies that suggest that. Um, and I think in general, people enjoy being here, enjoy specific aspects of Puget Sound. But I think maybe for long-term residents, they have those places that are really meaningful and unique that they've been engaging with for longer periods of time. And I think that is why the length of, length of residence matters when it comes to shoreline sense of place. If you've been going to the same beach every weekend for like 10, 20 plus years, you probably have a stronger connection to that place than someone that just moved to town and maybe goes there every once in a while. Um, so in this case, I think when it comes to those specific places, it matters. Um, also residents ascribe different meanings, um, but I also think in general, this illustrates that shorelines matter and we should think about that um, when it comes to like planning and policy. And I think that it also illustrates that any type of shoreline change or modification could challenge residents' senses of place, um, which could lead to conflict. It could lead um, to a lot of different issues, especially if you're maybe installing shoreline armor on your property, or even if you wanna uh, uh, start a new restoration project, maybe it's important to recognize that you might be disrupting how someone feels about that particular place that you're working, or maybe you're enhancing it and you could build on that and try to acquire maybe new partners or community members to engage in your project. Um, and so lastly, I have another project that's very similar. Um, and this is actually like a little bit of a narrower dive into one particular location. So I, I've been conducting work, collaborative work with uh, Island County Local Integrating Organization, which is a watershed group based um, out of Island County's Department of Natural Resources. I've been working with them for three years um, and we decided to do our own shoreline related survey in Island County, given that it's a great county to do that. It consists of Whidbey and Camino Islands, um, extensive, wonderful shoreline. Um, and so we, we decided to do a study there. Um, and a lot of the impetus for this was we wanted to ensure there was more community input in planning and management um, with the goal of gauging Island County residents 
um, natural resource value. So this was part value survey, um, but then the second part was a sense of place of shoreline survey. Um, and we ended up actually conducting a survey and obtaining uh, over 300 res uh, respondents um, just last year. Um, this was highly collaborative um, and even uh, the tools itself that we used to gauge resident sense of place included a lot of watershed group input. So like this was a highly collaborative project. It was very fun to work on. Um, so what we found was that Again, residents have a high and strong sense of place, uh, particularly attachment, sense of responsibility, uh, independence. Um, compared to the 12 county survey that I just showed you, um, uh, both for Puget Sound regions, sp specifically as it relates to shorelines, Island County actually appears to have a greater sense of place compared to other residents um, in the region. It, tends to, it seems to be stronger. Uh, and this survey had a, a unique element in which we actually integrated a map. Um, so we had a heat map question. We actually had people um, use their cursor or their finger if they were on an iPhone or an iPad to actually select what were those sites, like those meaningful locations in their county. Um, and so this is a, a, a map uh, that displays those responses. So the, the brighter red are the more touches, clicks, if you will. Um, and so what we found is that uh, all of these were public parks for the most part. Um, so residents in the county really find public parks meaningful. They go to them and they interact with them um, often. Um, and we also asked an open-ended question and I haven't done any sophisticated analysis of any of this data yet, although I hope to um, soon. So I'm actually gonna be showing you the most frequently used words and we found that the most frequently used words among Island County residents when it came to shoreline meaning was life, um, which I think was also mentioned um, by one of the participants earlier. Uh, we have nature, uh, connection, beach, uh, and peace. So somewhat similar to the responses of the 12 county, um, but life was definitely more prominent and that was not seen in the previous survey. Um, and so, Overall, again, we see that respondents have a stronger high sense of place uh, to the area's shorelines, um, slightly higher than the broader region. Um, and meaningful shoreline sites are accessible public parks. And I think we need to really emphasize the importance of public spaces and access to those spaces because they are meaningful and we should support them. Um, and I think that in general, this survey was done with a specific reason and it actually is helping to prioritize shorelines and specific shoreline locations in planning and decision-making um, in Island County's uh, ecosystem recovery plan. So some like shared takeaways, people really are connected to not only the natural environment, but also shorelines. Um, and individuals in the, re in the region have many different types of meanings that they ascribe to these places, um, including feelings. And I think it's important to, to recognize that we have these feelings that we attribute to place, that places make us feel something, including calm or peaceful. Um, you know, there's, there's this whole idea of like blue spaces, for example, um, that provides a sense of calm to people. That's why people go to the beach or go on the water because it is therapeutic and we need to recognize that more. Um, and it's also interesting that sense of places is informed by place of residence, length of residence sometimes, um, and even property ownership, that there are these distinctions among different groups. Um, and I think that we need to consider and include re resident sense of place in how we make decisions, create plans, and even tell our stories. Um, and we need to better foster and harness people's connections to the ecosystem for recovery purposes and for management, planning, and policy more broadly. And I think people's connections and relationships to place, including the beach, matter. Um, and I think that there are a lot of different applications of sense of place because it is this like powerful, potentially influential concept. Um, so for example, it informs our well-being, behaviors, but also explain, partly explains why places matter or not. Um, there's also increasing recognition of its applications. Um, and I think it also demonstrates how the social sciences can help solve complex environmental problems, um, which are almost entirely people problems. If we understand why a place matters or doesn't to people, that can really help 
managers or restoration practitioners on the ground. Um, and so, so moving forward, I am working on two new sense of place projects outside of Puget Sound that I just wanted to share. Um, so one is a sense of place of the Baltic Sea and Seaside among Estonian coastal residents, and I'll be conducting that this year. Um, and then I just started a project on how sense of place and, and purposefully creating sense of place programming um, as it relates to nature can help foster um, inclusion among Oregon's Russian and Ukrainian population. Um, so thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, and I look forward to any questions you may have. And this is the part of the presentation where the crowd goes wild. Sending <laughs> in everybody's round of applause here. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Trimbach. David, that was great. Um, I, I like to always, I, I have the stage here, so I get to ask all my questions while other people are typing their questions in the comments here and I'll moderate those your way as they come in. Um, but I'm just thinking about, uh, you know, sense of place and how that fits so nicely with the Harbor Wild Watch mission. And I'm thinking like, do we need to contract you to like see if, okay, if you've gone on a Harbor Wild Watch beach walk, how does that increase your sense of place? Cause now like you're connected with the flatworms and you've seen an octopus and snuggled with a sea star. Like, um, I like to think that that really helps connect folks to their, to their Puget Sound here and hopefully inspires that stewardship and positive action to protect these cool places that we get to play on. So. Um. <laughs> Definitely, I think that's yeah. true. I think that, uh, I do think that programs that involve the public in some way, uh, bringing them to the beach or bringing them to some sort of natural area and really get them to think differently about where where they are um, and they get to interact with where they are. I think that that, can be evaluated. You, you could do like a before and after or a series of surveys over time with participants to see if people do change because I bet that they do. I bet they do feel more connected after these experiences. Awesome, okay, for you board members tuning in, here's some good ideas for us to <laughs> move forward. Um, yeah, um, I'm also thinking, what is it? Liminal landscape sounds like a great like trans band name. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that. um, so let's see. I'm always wondering. I feel like maybe I'm gonna refresh the page because I imagine we have some good questions coming in. But for whatever reason, I'm gonna flip between flip between screens here. Um, how did you get connected with doing a project? Do you get to travel to Estonia to do this work or mm -hmm. how, how did you get roped into that world? That sounds like an exciting <laughs> adventure. Yeah, so I will go to Estonia at some point during the year. Um, and my previous research, what I did prior to coming to Puget Sound, um, my dissertation focused on Estonia. So I actually lived and worked there um, at different times over like four years. Um, and most of my work focused on um, like sense, like partly sense of place among Russian Im like essentially immigrants who live in Estonia. Um, and so I was really interested in trying to connect what I do now with what I did before. And this seemed like a really good fit. Um, and Estonia has extensive shoreline, lots of islands, uh, historic fishing community, and I really wanted to explore that within the context of climate change. So shorelines are changing just like they are and will here. And I'm really interested on what does climate change and its, in, and its impacts like sea level rise on shorelines, what does that do to people? What, how does that make them feel about the shore? How does that impact their interactions with the shore? And how can we ensure that planners or managers are taking those into account? Rad. Yeah, I think the climate change, I mean, I'm thinking about Owen Beach and how it's closed right now. Somebody mentioned in the comments that they missed Point Defiance and I'm not entirely sure if that's just because they haven't been there in a while or moved elsewhere. Um, but yeah, definitely, I know that access to the park for, is kind of a bummer for the summer, not being able to go down there, but I guess you can still walk along that seawall and <laughs> 
get out there, but um, not the same. <laughs> it is interesting. And thinking about how our shorelines will change with climate change and sea level rise, and um, yeah, how that project I think has has sea level rise in mind with how they're developing that space to be more accessible and. Um, yeah, just that I like that reminder that accessible public parks is really important for for humans. And I know I know I have a lot of parks that bring me lots of joy. And <laughs> maybe if people don't have questions, maybe you can enter in the comments some of your favorite places here in the Puget Sound. And uh, that's a good idea. And compare notes and see if like um, I know we get to go out to Salt Creek for this next low tide swing. Um, so. There will be some some very fun videos coming your way soon, uh, as well as some beach walks and beach monitoring. I know I, I'd be curious how also like the digital transition. So we've been doing a lot of digital programming um, in the interest of safety and not, you know, uh, I like to think that our beach walks would be prime for super spreader events. So we don't want to do that because we'd have way too much fun with all these cool humans. And so we got to keep it digital for a while longer. Uh, but you know, how does that, I think there's something that's a little extra magical about a hands-on slimy moon snail in your paws versus like seeing it on screen. Um, interesting how that, but also then we're connecting like, like my parents in Montana get to come on beach walks more often because uh, that's not something they, you know, they get to do that virtually, whereas they wouldn't be able to do that. So an interesting added layer of <laughs> information there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I feel like there there has been a study done on um, virtual space and virtual access to space. Like I think there was a study done on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia and how residents feel about it, about it changing negatively. And even individuals who had never been there and didn't even live close to it, because they could interact with it virtually in some way, they actually did feel something. Um, they did have like a, a degree of sense of place related to it, even though they could only interact to it, with it through the web, which is super interesting. That is interesting. Huh, amazing. Um, well, I put out one more call for questions. <laughs> Uh, I know for whatever reason, I was getting to see everyone's comments through looking at it through my personal page versus the Harbor Wild Watch one, which seems totally backwards because you think that <laughs> since we're going live through Harbor Wild Watch, we'd be able to see the questions there. So uh, I'm not sure if something techie weird is going on because we did have a lot of good engagement with the, the three questions. So. Uh, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I'm sure there's wonders out there. But it looks like, uh, yeah, here's our contact information. So if we're if we're missing your wonders for because of some weird technical glitch here, um, <laughs> sounds like you can send those send those David's way. And, Please uh, do. Yeah. So, is there any anything else you'd like to to share with us this evening? Um, I think. Yeah, no, I think that's it. But if anyone has any interest in this um, or want to talk further, please feel free to reach out anytime. Yeah, I think share the love for the the Salish Sea. I guess I'd be, is there any uh, Salish Sea, like as that um, name starting to take off and people kind of relating to like beyond the Puget Sound? I do not think so based on my research. Based on what you know. Um, I do think that Washingtonians are very much so connected to Puget Sound as a name and idea. And I think it is, I think it'll take a lot of work to get people to think beyond that. Fair. Yeah. Change Someday. is hard. Yeah, it <laughs> is. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you again so much, David, for joining us for Cocktails of Fishtails. Um, we appreciate having you and maybe someday we'll see you in person out on the beach, uh, inspiring some more of that sense of place. I just think that is such an important part of, you know, that, that sense of care. And so if you, if you don't know about a place, if you haven't been there, I guess you can attend virtually, um, but knowing about it definitely gives you that opportunity uh, to care about it. And if you care about it, then you get to probably make some positive changes. And so that's, that's kind of the hope and the goals here. So, 
uh, definitely appreciate the work that you do and having the, the data to back it up is beautiful. Definitely love science. So um, yeah, thanks again. And um, for all of you tuning in, um, thank you for watching. Thanks for your comments. Thanks for your questions. Uh, feel free to share this video after we post it and you know get people pumped about the Puget Sound and uh, yeah, thinking, thinking, reflecting on what words you might think of um, in regards to this place. So uh, with that, I guess uh, here's a quick plug to tune into some more digital beach walks coming this week. We have uh, the end of our summer science series uh, happening. So we'll be beach monitoring some local spots and looking at some oysters, which uh, maybe sense of place and like deliciousness of the Puget Sound residents. <laughs> that gets you excited, you know, whatever, whatever strikes your fancy will rope you in there. Um, and yeah, and then also we have some volunteer opportunities coming up because we are going to open the visitor center here in July. Um, and so if you're itching to get out there and uh, talk about all the cool creatures in the Puget Sound, um, we'll have our get our touch tanks back up and running in the sandbox. I don't know how much touching will actually be available, but uh, if you want to talk to some humans and get them excited about the Puget Sound, um, you can email us, uh, steen at harborwildwatch.org, or I think Lindsay's really leading the charge on the volunteers center stuff. So you can email her too, but really we'll, we'll get you get you plugged in if that's something you're interested in. And um, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll keep sharing this. Uh, this presentation will be shared through our newsletter. So if you're not subscribed to that, that's a good way to stay up to date with all the fun digital stuff that we're up to. And as we transition back to in-person sometime, uh, you'll, you'll get the first notice there as well. So uh, I think that's all the announcements I have on my end. Um, and again, just I'm so thankful to host you and all the folks who tuned in on this beautiful June day. Um, we appreciate it. So with that, I'm going to say learn, have fun, and uh, I'm going to end our live stream. So cheers. <laughs>